and I just want to introduce Thomas all very briefly, but there's no brief introduction to any of these speakers because Thomas, Jay, and Brian honestly are not only the thought leaders, but the great pioneers of the technology. And Thomas has really, I dare even say how many years you've been doing this. I mean, you just have to go to these booths and see what's been done. The, the one thing I did was the, the touch, the heat touch. He's, Matteo has been working with an infrared camera, and it's just a trip to make the world interactive with your finger. Anyway, take it away. Uh, Jay, thank you. Thank you, twice. First of all, mentioning us, that's super good. Uh, marketing is recording the session, so that's all good. Uh, secondly, uh, thank you for talking about real opportunities so I can speak about the big visions for the interactive world. So inside the presentation, how can you tell if it's a big vision or if it's actually something we are doing? It's actually quite simple. If the slides are nice and look all designed, then this is what we're doing right now. And if they get sloppy and the videos don't render well, that's the research stuff we are doing. So I'll start with the nice marketing slide. Who is Matteo? I'll just go through it briefly. We've been around forever. Actually, when I started in augmented reality in 1999, I still had hair. And um, well, 15 years later, essentially, I don't have hair anymore, but I still believe in big visions. Uh, today, we are providing uh, mostly software solutions to the nice market of computer vision and augmented reality. And if we're drilling this down, we have the internal mission statement of always on, always augmented. Sounds nice. Once again, nice slide, marketing slide. But what we really mean with that, that we as a company work on the technology, software, hardware technology, but we are also starting to work quite actively with device manufacturers to bring augmented reality to new form factors like wearables. And then, you know, we have to, to survive as an augmented reality company, but also we have to evangelize the market. We're working together with big brands to essentially build unique experience which show the value of augmented reality. To summarize that, a uh, quick video of what we are doing in the space, and it's also summarizing what we've done in the last <coughs> 12 months. One second. Here we go. So this is our showreel from 2013. We call it a year of uh, AI innovation. Uh, the big vision is, and uh, I hope, Jay, you believe in it, it's the augmented city, the ubiquitous augmented reality. We believe that you need dedicated hardware to actually implement that, but we also believe that we need good content developers. So one very strong focus for the company has always been to support content developers the augmented reality. Things we are doing, or spaces we are doing augmented reality in, is still the enterprise space, a space which has a lot of niche application, but very profitable, very ROI driven applications. Then sales tools is something we're also very active in. This was generated with Mitsubishi. It's a simple sales tool. You can visualize HVACs in your environment and superimpose it. Coolest application in my view, 2013, developer on our Cheneo platform. It's a Pinguin application, which guides you to the Pinguin uh, aquarium. McDonald's, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry for being first, but that was only Europe. I guess you're launching globally, Jay. And then one of the biggest deployments of augmented reality with IKEA, putting virtual furniture in your environment. I'm a dad of two young kids. That's a party trainer we had developed here in the US. It's basically a little interactive toy which teaches, ki it teaches kids how to use the toilet. You can see the excitement right there. Very useful <laughs> application in itself. Then we got uh, Audi uh, being one of our strong customers, replacing printed manually, uh, manuals with augmented reality, and then more in the service and maintenance bay, VW deploying augmented reality uh, in the service bay. This is our own conference, and I'll go to the next marketing slide. Our product line on what is special in our view is that we believe, and this is also important in my view for the ecosystem, that in order to bring first class augmented reality and computer vision to the market, you have to deliver a unique vertical offering which starts with hardware optimization, what we are doing together with our friends at Intel, 
for example, and I'll say Intel, and also software solutions, but also content creation and end users to, uh, together. And uh, once again, I'm not making this up, but we also have a special announcement uh, today, which is basically uh, the usage numbers. Once again, when I started in 1999, there was one user of augmented reality that was essentially me in my lab. And boy, have we grown in the last 15 uh, years, essentially. I guess the biggest number or the most important number for me is that we are having 1,000 daily starts of our content management tool because I've always was under the impression that the content will eventually drive augmented reality, and we're extremely happy that we have 1,000 people actually developing content for augmented reality. Now we're getting to the middle part. Where will this lead, lead us? We're seeing augmented reality slowly gravitating from pure augmented reality to channel purpose computer vision. And if we look at the deployment of general purpose computer vision, we can say, okay, people want to deploy it in a micro environment or in a macro environment. If we look at the micro environment, we do augmented reality on objects, on cars, on IKEA catalogs, on party training applications. We do augmented reality on humans. Fairly, you know, manageable. We have tools out there. We can implement it. It is deployed. Where it's getting much harder from a tech point of view is when you're shifting computer vision and augmented reality into the macro space, where you all of a sudden want to do things like indoor location, outdoor location with augmented reality and essentially track unknown environments. As a company, we want to do it all, essentially, but from a tech point of view, it's getting increasingly hard to manage all these systems. So the broader vision from a computer vision point of view is, of course, you have one system which is out there. You turn on your cam camera, and it's sensing whatever is out there. But as you can tell here from the many bullet points you see on the key enablers and key features, it's a lot of development work. So where do we see the next hard spots, the next implementation points we have to focus on because we won't be able to implement that in the next 12 months. From the focal points, we're seeing tracking. Advent of RGBD sensors, very relevant. Our works with Intel RealSense, the RealSense camera, everything around RGB sensing will, in our view, revolutionize the tracking space. It will make it extremely robust and extremely accessible to people. And with RGBD tracking, we are also considering deploying SLAM-based tracking for all kinds of devices which don't have the sensors. But it's not only about tracking, it's also about interaction. And we heard it from Intel earlier that gesture-based interaction is a new model which is coming up. And Tisha also mentioned, mentioned thermal touch, which is something which I will show at the end of the presentation. But this is all on the tech side of things. On the perception side for augmented reality has always been rendering. And the rendering quality just has to get better on very sparse computing devices. Essentially, in augmented reality, you always superimpose something virtual. But in reality, it doesn't look realistic. So a couple of research results. And now the slides get, uh, I guess, more crappy, but I'll still show them. Uh, I'll show you a couple of results uh, from RGBD plus IMU sensor-based tracking in unknown environments. This is a typical indoor application. You start off at an unknown environment. You take your smartphone, you walk around, and the system is recording your relative trajectory in space. What is the application for that? Well, it's pretty given. It's indoor navigation, where you don't have GPS signals and still want to do things like navigation, but also want to do augmented reality. Pretty cool. Uh, the application uh, then implemented in a very nice European city uh, called Munich um, essentially is uh, doing a pathfinder 
through an actual museum and combine that with standard, what I call micro approaches for augmented reality. And you can see this here. What we are trying to do here with partners from the museum space is to essentially make, you know, museums more accessible to young people and have a direct overlay of information to a given piece of artwork on the mobile devices. And we actually tried it out. We rolled it out in January uh, in the museum. Uh, the feedback was fantastic, especially the, the, the young people uh, who just basically had uh, got much more engaged in the space. Now, I talked a little bit of doing SLAM or indoor navigation with RGB, um, uh, with RGB sensors. Of course, most of the devices unfortunately don't have RGBD uh, sensors in there, but if you have a device, you can do things like that, which is an ultra robust, ultra fast uh, trajectory calculation out of the visual clues get, uh, getting out of your RGBD camera. This is something which we were actually amazed by that we could achieve this qu quality of reconstruction uh, from essentially only the camera feed and no IMU connection. Now, taking the principle of RGBD and basically solve the dream of every augmented reality researcher, which is the freaking occlusion problem, right? We always render something in the forefront and it looks totally unrealistic, uh, is uh, something you can finally solve with what we call dense SLAM. And I'll show you the example. I actually like it a lot. It doesn't look that spectacular. I said no marketing slides, right? We're placing a virtual object, no initialization, nothing needed, no tracking pattern. But we also reconstruct the real environment in real time to do a live occlusion handling of the real objects versus the virtual object. And you can tell, or the experts can tell that it's not fake because the reconstruction is almost perfect, but not to 100% perfect. You actually see this on the edges here. So basically, once again, to, to stress on the importance of this, we basically take you know, an unknown environment, we start placing something virtual, we immediately start to reconstruct the environment and generate a dynamic occlusion model to occlude the real world with the virtual world, or vice versa. So this is uh, definitely an important step. What we are seeing is, and uh, I agree with many others in the space there, that uh, all of a sudden we are getting asked to have large scale deployments of augmented reality. And one thing that helps us tremendously in the space is that we start to offload parts of the heavy lifting computer vision to the cloud. And you can actually see this here. This is what we call continuous visual search with 2D uh, patterns. So essentially we do an ultra quick lookup on the cloud backend and then basically send back content to be overlaid on top of uh, the virtual object. Uh, the real object. This is what you can see here. This is also a development we have productized. Now we're coming once again to the 3D reconstruction. This is one of the coolest things. I got the video this morning. It's basically a 3D reconstruction only from the depth mass. The texture comes from the RGB sensors. And up here, actually, you can see the reconstructed result. On the right side, you see the depth the uh, model on the lower side, you see the normals on the object. This is something which we as computer vision scientists and augmented reality scientists never really had as a focal point, but the whole idea of reconstructing arbitrary real objects for all kinds of purposes, from online shopping to augmented reality placement, is something which will also, in my view, bring a whole nother lot of new use cases. Doing funny things the faces First slide, it's a five hour video, so I'll skip through it a little bit faster. Uh, here, you know, I only have a minute left. So here we do a real time face reconstruction and then a tracking. It's actually implemented on a Kinect and we started to ship it actually from last week on as a beta, right? Beta means it's a big vision, essentially, in our lingo. Uh, in the next version, it will be stable, I'm pretty sure. Uh, what you can see here, though, is, and it's actually phenomenal, is that we are in real time reconstructing the face and don't worry about the rendering quality, and then use this reconstructed face to superimpose virtual content and use it for the live tracking stage. It all looks still potentially a little bit gimmicky because we haven't looked into really 
improving the rendering quality. And for this, I'm showing you hopefully this video. Uh, it of course got accepted at ISMA. So what we are seeing here is that we are in real time reconstructing the light situation out of a simple RGB image. And depending on where the light is coming from, we are casting shadows and manipulating the colors on the virtual overlay of this mask, essentially. Um, the guy doesn't look happy. Uh, I think everyone else was pretty happy. I'll show you the most phenomenal part. This is actually now, if we're not only taking uh, grayscale information, but also color information into that, and you see this light source changing its color from red to blue, you see uh, the superimposition also change that. And then finally, you can put in shadows, and you see this here, how the shadows are casted from a real world light source through a virtual object onto the real face, and I think that's uh, actually pretty cool. Yeah, this is all coming up at some point. What's also coming up at some point, and with that I would <coughs> want to conclude, is that we are essentially solving the fundamental problem that all of a sudden is now talking about head-worn devices and how they will revolutionize computer vision and augmented reality, but very few people actually think about how we will interact the objects in the real world, and Tish, you mentioned it, we have it here, as the, uh, here at AWE as a demo at our booth. It is kind of a crude demo, right? This is real augmented reality. Uh, see me twice here, essentially. Um, but what we are really doing, and uh, the first part is the marketing part, um, we are essentially attaching a thermal camera or heat sensor, visual heat sensor, to head-worn devices and then look into the world, and we let the user touch arbitrary touch points in the real environment, and then this thermal sensor is reading the heat which is coming from the fact that you touched something real. And if you then combine this with a visual tracker, right, like a normal 2D tracker, whatever tracker, you can make a system which makes any real-world object a touchable object. And here we are explaining that it actually works. We have the demonstrator, well, it works in 20 to 60% of the cases. Uh, but uh, we have the demonstrator here. What you see here, we're using the visual light camera to track essentially the newspaper. Then we superimpose the thermal image. We, we take computer vision technologies to read out this heat signature. And with that, we can create a world of touch screens, essentially, which we can use and deploy. This is an idea, in our view, how you know research will change the way we interact with virtual content. But once again, I have to be at least to 50% an engineer here. This you won't see it in the next iPhone. That's pretty sure. I guess then fair to say. Uh, to conclude. Um, Last but not least, thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much for moderating. And also, I would want to invite you for our conference Inside AR together with ISMA this year in Munich. And as you know, and I always say, the beer is fantastic in Munich. Unfortunately, not the weather. Thank you very much. I know we're running really late, but let's have a couple of questions. I know some people are dying to ask something. Yes, more than a couple, looks like. Hello. Um, I'd like to address two elephants in the room, and I'm going to ask you to see if you can help us out. Uh, I'm coming at this from an app developer perspective. My first elephant, if you will, is why do you think that AR apps have yet to monetize? That's my first question. <clears throat> my second question is that uh, there's a local develop and I'm, I'm going to say this because I don't want to come across negative, but um, there's a development award that in mobile apps is considered the largest in the world called the Best App Ever Awards. And uh, my studio, two of the last four years, have won AR App of the Year. And we were one of the first to sign up for your you know, NDA for the Qualcomm SDK. And I'm sitting here as an app developer, and I'm looking at all these different presentations just from this one session alone, the Intel presentation, your presentation, and I'm saying, is it realistic that an app developer such as ourselves could, could practically deploy 
apps on all these different platforms. Mm -hmm. So please, the second elephant in the room is this. We have all these platforms for a industry that is yet to monetize, so how would you credibly, as an app developer, navigate this universe? Yeah, so I guess the first part of your question, how do you monetize? To be honest with you, no straight answer, right? What I'm seeing in the market is that there are a lot of people who monetize on services. And I've always said this, uh, especially for app developers, they can, in my view or what I hear, uh, create fairly good revenues from offering services in the space. And now for the one you develop, it's a complete different story in my view. They you know, monetize through clicks. If you look at an IKEA app, it has been the most successful marketing app on many app stores for a certain while. They had, I guess what's in the public domain, 15 million downloads for the app, and they had more than two million actual AR usages in the app. Now, did they charge the user anything for? Certainly not, but it's the marketing effect which drove them into. Right? and they've enlarged their engagement in the space. That's all I can tell you. The second one, multi-platform. Multi-platform is always a challenge. We are our own developer, right? The, the SDKs which are out there, not only the Mateo SDK, uh, SDK are cross-platforms, but of course you won't potentially the, uh, not see the Mateo SDK on very small platforms, right? But in our uh, case, it's actually manageable and doable to deploy across different platforms. Just, I, I would add something because this came up at the Neurogaming conference when, to the VC panel. And in fact, the, the VC answer to this for some of these you know, Neurogaming apps or ideas that are kind of right out there on the, the edge is really subscription models are proving very viable for people in that space. And of course, it depends what you're doing. And the whole thing about all of the platforms applies to every single developer of any mobile app. That's just a you know, a huge problem for everyone. But I think, you know, that's the, you know, it's really about being, you have to not only be an app developer, but you have to really think about your market opportunity and there's no escaping it. It doesn't mean just because you build it, they'll come. So, yeah, I think it applies to anything. <laughs> it's, it's one more question. I think we're probably running pretty late. Thank you. Uh, I really like this uh, thermal touch uh, sensing thing. How far are we away from this? And are we looking into something like uh, uh, Bluetooth camera integration with uh, uh, thermal sensors? This is a cheap $200 thermal sensor that you can hook up to your iPhone. So I don't see why this is something that couldn't occur sooner. Yeah, uh, I guess my initial statement is it's so much easier to sell things that don't work than to sell things that actually work. Uh, taking this into consideration, um, I'll tell you the truth, okay? It was a government-funded research project. We got the camera. It was sitting on a shelf for three years, okay? Someone found it, played around with it, and came up with the idea. Ever since, it's gotten a little bit more serious because we were wowed by the technology itself, did the patent work, did the research on it and everything. But uh, obviously, it's more driven, as you've rightfully said, by the device makers than by us. I mean, check out the demo. It's OK working at an early research level. It's certainly not deployable, but it has the potential to be uh, very quickly deployable once you have the sensors. In my view, especially if you look at head-worn devices, there's a unique uh, you know, position there because ideally if you touch something, you look at it, right? I mean, very few people do this, right? And that way you can use relatively small resolution thermal sensors because you have a very narrow field of view to fill as long as you look where you're touching, essentially. So I would agree, but it's uh, more up to the, to the hardware guys when are they integrating that. We've definitely seen huge interest ever since we released the video uh, last week. Yeah. yeah, you don't need a very, uh, very sophisticated device to actually do this, but you cover it yourself, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. I mean, the, the thermal sensor you've seen in the video is, of course, this $10,000 device or whatever, but uh, essentially, and this is also kind of hard to wear, by the way. Uh, but uh, the potential is definitely uh, there to take relatively low-cost sensors. Thank you, Thomas. I think we're going to have to close the session yeah. and have a break. Yeah.